I want to welcome everybody to week two of That's Deep. Everyone that's here live at 514 Church and everyone that's watching online. We are so excited to continue this journey together of looking what, at what Jesus calls spiritual maturity, what is really deep according to Christ, not just according to Christians. And to, kept, to catch you up, if you didn't watch or didn't hear last week, you can always jump on the app, go online and catch up, but I'll do a quick recap. Last week what we said is that Jesus decides what depth is and it's the goal that he sets forth for our faith. When we attain that goal, when we reach that goal, that that is deep. And at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he called 12 disciples through this process of reaching out to them and asking them to join him. And in the process, he defined for them what it would look like when they followed him. And this is what it says in the book of Matthew, uh, who was one of those followers. He was a tax collector that Jesus would eventually go back and ask to follow him as well. But when he finds some men on the Sea of Galilee who are in a trap, if you will, politically and religiously, he says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of people. I will make you fish for people. Essentially, he showed up into their life and fished for them, got them out of their mess, and then he took them through a process and ultimately, at the end of his ministry, he had them and told them again what he told them at the beginning, which is go and fish for people. And so the goal, or in other words, spiritual depth, is reaching and helping people. Reaching and helping people. Now, this, this is no surprise to those of us that grew up in the church because we hear Jesus talk about the new commandment, go and love one another as I have loved you, and we're going to talk more about that over the coming weeks, but essentially with this passage, we get this process for how God is leading us to spiritual depth, and it looks a little bit like this, decide to follow Jesus, then you're going to grow, you're going to go through this process of learning and experiencing who Jesus is, and then as a result of all that, you're going to catch you're gonna catch people, you're gonna fish for people, you're gonna reach people, you're gonna connect with people, and you're gonna help people. And then ultimately, repeat, go over and over again, grow some more, reach some more people constantly, and then when those people follow you as you follow Christ, then those people will grow, and then they will start to catch. Ultimately saying, catching people, reaching people, helping people, Meeting people's needs, spiritually, physically, that is spiritual depth. And what happens, and we talked about this last week, is that people get caught up in this growth area, and they believe that this growth area becomes the goal. Because when we learn something, it's exciting. When we experience our faith, it gets exciting, it gets um, moving, it, it can change us, and we can ultimately want more of that growth, more knowledge, more experience, and then the goal that Jesus set out, making this whole experience about other people, can be evaded by those of us who dive into the growth section of our faith more than the actual goal of our faith. And growth is a wonderful thing. We have to grow, we have to learn, we have to experience. Jesus did this with his disciples. He took them along on a journey. They grew a ton and then he said, now go and do this. But it's very important that we know that growth is not the goal. That your growing is for a purpose. That as you grow and as you gain knowledge, as you gain experiences, that you and I have to tip our burden, we have to tip our compassion, we have to tip our commitment to what God has set out in front of us as the goal of our spiritual faith, and that is to reach and help people. And so with everything that we're doing here at this church as followers of Christ, we have to ask the question, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we learning? Why are we experiencing this? Why are we worshiping God? Why are we giving money? What is the goal of all of this? And put people in our sights. I was... Uh, Recently, out of town with our leadership team, and we were, we were growing and learning and getting better a, a, as a leadership team, and we spent some time in Indianapolis, and we went to dinner one night, and we had this waitress named Jessica who was the most knowledgeable waitress I've ever met in my life. She knew everything about everything. 
Like, we were like, hey, so what are the best appetizers? She was like, oh, let me tell you. And she started to unpack every detail and every piece of the recipe and all the different ingredients. She says, like this and like this. Oh, and this one has a little splash of this. And she was using, like, ingredient words I don't even know, I didn't know existed. And she was passionate, and she knew everything. And then she said, before she even got us water, she said, can I tell you about the specials? We're like, Okay. She just started talking about the specials. We got this fish and we got this thing and she's unpacking it. She's like, I'm a foodie. I love food and I know everything there is to know about all these, these, these uh, dishes that are in front of you. There's me and one other girl here. We spend every weekend traveling around where these foods are made and learn about them so that we can come here and do a better job helping you. We were like, what is happening right now? What is going on with this? And so this, this girl, as she's describing our meals when we were ordering, just continued to give so much information that it was overwhelming. And it was just like, I just don't even know how to have a conversation with this person because they know so much about food and, and they're just going to tell me. And so ultimately I was like, okay, we need to kind of like, you know, get past food and have a little bit of a normal conversation. So we said, where are you from? And she said, I'm, I'm from here. I'm from Indianapolis. Um, and she asked where we were from. We said, we're from Columbus, Ohio. And she said, oh, my, my boyfriend is from Bryan, Ohio. And, oh, is there some Bryan, Ohio people here? Wow. And, and, and when, when she said that, a light bulb went off in my head. I got so excited because I happened to know something about Bryan, Ohio that is trivia most people don't know. And it has to do with food. And I was thinking, this girl will not know what I'm about to say. And I said, hey, Jess, did you happen to know that dum-dums are from Bryan, Ohio? Imagine that I knew all was going to happen before the actual meal, and I pulled these out of my shirt. (laughs) Did you know that dum-dums are from Bryan, Ohio? Without missing a beat, she goes, oh, yeah, I've toured the factory. Did you know you could tour the factory? And when we toured the factory, she said, and you can go through there and you can order a box of any flavor you want, but not mystery because they can't put mystery in it because that's the whole point. <laughs> I was like, oh, what? And like she, she, she like one-upped my one-up. And then she did the unthinkable. Then she did something that I literally just came out of nowhere, took me totally by surprise. She goes, oh, and did you know what else? Right before she leaves the table, she goes, you know what else is from Brian Ohio? I was like, oh, man. She knows more about me than everything and everything. She goes, did you know what else is from there? Etch a sketch. And I was like, oh, man. And I didn't even know if it was true. I like pull out my, my phone and I'm like, it is. Dum Dums and Etch a Sketch is from Bryan, Ohio. This person knows everything. I was gonna literally, like, I bought this for this moment, and I was gonna write on here Dum Dum with an arrow pointing up, because, like, I'm the Dum Dum, and she's the Smarty. But, like, I mean, what am I, Buddy the Elf? I don't have time for that. It's way harder than you think. Here's the thing what, what can happen is that knowledge can become the goal in our faith. And knowledge can be so intoxicating and knowledge can be so almost attractive when someone talks about something that they know and they know so much about it. And and then when you start to go down the path of knowing something in any field, it can be kind of what it becomes about. But if we're not careful, when knowledge becomes the goal and not the purpose of that knowledge, we miss the point altogether. I mean, doctors go to school for all these different years not to just continue to do tests but to do surgery. They learn a bunch of stuff in order to to accomplish a goal, to be able to help people. And in our faith, it's really no different. And we can get caught up in the information part. And oftentimes, knowledge becomes the goal because it's um, it's so painted by society that knowledge is important. And of course, it is important. But it can become too important, a double-edged sword. It can become this thing that becomes the end in and of itself, learning more stuff. And, of course, education is something you've got to have an education. You can chase after an education. You learn something. And then you start to grow in your faith, and I want to learn something. I want to learn something. And then getting a degree, the, the society that we live in says you're more important if you have this degree or you're more valuable. And so it's very difficult to kind of parse through the good part of knowledge and the part of knowledge that can really damage us and make 
our lives all about what we're learning as opposed to what we're doing. And knowledge in terms of our faith is something that's supposed to be a part of the growth process as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus, as we grow and we rightly divide what the scriptures are called the word of truth and we understand it and we, we get the full counsel of God, the manifold wisdom of God and we learn, we're supposed to learn and gain all that stuff but the purpose of that learning is not just so that we can get smarter and we can feel better about ourselves and we can be the one that knows everything because ultimately when you run into someone like Jessica and she was really sweet but I, I honestly couldn't spend much more time with her if everything she talked about was food and every time we talked about food I had nothing to say because she knew everything. And people can become that way in their faith where it's just all about information and oh, and did you know this? And oh, and did you know this? And oh, and did you know this? And in the process of oh, and did you know this? I'm going, did you see me leave five minutes ago? Because you're annoying to be around. Because it's all about what you know as opposed to this relationship, this dynamic. And so what we want to talk about today is the goal of knowledge is not to know something but to build someone. Why are we learning what we learn? Why, do we, why are we understanding things about the faith? Why are we following Jesus? Why are we learning the stories of Jesus? Why are we putting our time and energy into, into devotional time or, or studying the scriptures or, or spending time in a small group and having a discussion about what the scriptures say and how that applies to our life? Why are we doing all of that work if it's just to know? It's supposed to be to go and catch. It's supposed to be to go and fish. And in 1 Corinthians, what we see is one of the authors of the New Testament, a man named Paul, who had an amazing experience and an encounter with Jesus. You can read about it in the book of Acts. He went from there and he started to, to plant churches and, and go through Asia Minor and to the Gentiles and to people that weren't Jews and teach them about who God was and what Jesus did when he rose from the dead and how that has sparked this new gospel, this new idea of resurrection and life and goodness and so people in certain cities like Corinth which was like a mini Rome they were on fire for Jesus and, 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 and telling everyone about Jesus and they had this new God and he was a God that rose from the dead and people were excited and Paul would go to these places and start a, a church and then he would leave and he would check back in with them and hear different things about the church and what they're going through and in Corinth this church that was uh, really a, kind of a, a crossroad for uh, industry, a crossroad for, for, mer for merch, merchanting, um, what, what's the word, merchants? For merchants, trading, selling goods, different gods and different ideas and different worlds were all crossed in Corinth. And so he is in the midst of this thing that also at Corinth they had some of the largest temples to worship foreign gods. And so Christianity ends up in this place, um, Corinth, where they're now worshiping Jesus, but there's all this temple worship that's happening. And in those temples, they're sacrificing animals, and they are worshiping gods, and they're sacrificing animals to worship those gods. And so there are Christian people who had learned this combination of truth from the Old Testament that you're not supposed to eat animals that are um, deemed unclean by the Old Testament. And so there are some people that, that feel like we can't eat this food that's sacrificed to this, to this foreign God and we can't eat certain foods that God called unclean in the, in the Old Testament. Well, then there's another group of people who learned from Peter, who was a direct follower of Jesus, that God, through a vision, had told him, all the food, everything has been called clean. And so you can eat whatever you want. And so ultimately, there's a dispute between the people in Corinth as to what God says we're allowed to eat and what we're not allowed to eat. And so Paul, he deals with all kinds of, of problems in the, the church at Corinth. And then in this chapter, chapter 8, he unpacks this issue about food that is sacrificed to idols. And I'm going to look at that with you, and we're going to see what it says to us about knowledge and how that applies to how we engage our faith in the goal of reaching and helping people. He says, now about foods sacrificed to idols. I'm going to talk to you about the food. There are some of you that are eating this food, and there are some of you that are saying it's not okay to eat this food. And then he says this, 
We, all, we know that we all possess knowledge. We all possess knowledge. He puts it in quotes because there was a group of them that knew what Peter taught and there was a group of them that didn't know what Peter taught. And so what they're doing is they're the ones that know that they're allowed to eat it. They're boasting, saying, we're smarter than you and we're allowed to eat whatever we want. And ultimately, that is offending the people who think that they shouldn't eat it. And so there's a conflict among the people. And the ones that know this vision from Peter are going, we're smarter than you. We have knowledge. We know something that you don't know. And we're smart. We're like the ones that are filled with like the next level of vision. We have the most information. We, we're ahead of the curve. We're smarter than you. And so Paul, as, he, as he's writing them, he's like, look, I know this same truth. You can sit there and say that you're smarter, but you are missing the point of knowing that piece of information. Because knowing that piece of, piece of information is great, but actually what it's doing is it's causing a problem among you and among the people at the church in Corinth. And then he says this. He says, we know that we all possess knowledge. Some of you are saying I'm smarter than this. He says, but to those of you that, that say you're smarter because you know this piece of information about the faith that some other people don't, Knowledge, it puffs you up. It makes you arrogant, he says. He says, so when you know something, you have to be so careful, it's so great to learn things, but what can happen when you learn something is it can make you arrogant. It can make you prideful. And then that pride can turn into broken relationships among people. When we make knowledge the goal, it can be a double-edged sword, it can be a poison that makes us puff up. The word puff here means to bubble. And the picture that he's going is like, when you know something and you just have information, it's kind of a faux version of growing. You think you're more mature. You think that you're special. You think that you're ahead, but actually it's just a bubble. You don't see yourself the way you should because knowledge should not make you feel like you're better than other people and you shouldn't exercise certain things you know that are true if it causes friction between you and other people. So you know something, big deal. There's something that you're missing in the midst of knowing what you know. Another way to put it is, is this, is knowledge isn't the enemy. It's fine to know, but it can make you one. You see, when you start to like get filled with pride and you operate from pride, you cause friction between you and the people around you. And knowledge has this ability to blind you to where it's like we have made following Jesus all about knowing the next thing and learning the next thing and we know more than them, but ultimately we don't care about them anymore. We just care about us because now we know something new. And it can become this endless, bottomless pit of I need to know more stuff and the whole time, you can know something and not actually reach or help somebody. You see, this is a classic story throughout the scriptures where information and knowledge makes us struggle in relationship. The Pharisees were a group of religious leaders alive uh, and well and, and, and operating in the time of Christ in the first century. And their whole idea was to guard the truth. These were men that knew the scriptures better than anybody. The people of Israel have a rich heritage and tradition of truth and story and, and scrolls and, and life and what it was all about. But the Pharisees are the one that studied it every single word. They were so smart, it's been said, that they would memorize scroll after scroll. And sometimes they would be able to take a scroll and put one on top of another and have so many scrolls, five to ten scrolls. And it's said that if you took a pin and put it through the top scroll, if there were ten stacked up, that if you put a pin through the scroll and they could see what, like, what word the pin went through on the top scroll, they could tell you what word the pin went through on all the other nine scrolls. They didn't just know the scriptures and what they said. They memorized the location of where these words were on a page. You see, the Pharisees were so wise and so smart in terms of the Old Testament predictions about who would come to be the Savior of the world, the Messiah, that they were actually the ones who were supposed to point out 
to the people of Israel, the Messiah, when he showed up. They were the ones that, that knew about Bethlehem and that knew about Egypt and that knew about um, a baby being born of a, vir a virgin and all the different pieces of information that would make the Savior pop up onto the landscape and then it was their job to be a billboard and go, there he is. We know. We're smart. But ultimately, when Jesus showed up on the scene, their knowledge had become pride. And it had puffed them up. And it made them like enemies. Enemies with one another. And enemies with this person who was Jesus, who they didn't know was God. They just thought he was a person. But they were so full of pride that they called him a blasphemer. And they ultimately were the ones responsible for Jesus being crucified. Which is part of God's, of course, divine plan. But the point is, you can know a lot. And you can know so much, and it can cause you to do the worst possible thing imaginable. So knowledge is not a bad thing, but it can make you the enemy. Knowledge isn't the enemy, but it can make you an enemy of other people. It can cause friction and discord and, and discomfort. And when you are all about just knowing something as opposed to helping people, you become the kind of person that nobody wants to spend their time around. And you become the, become the kind of person that ends up on the offensive or on the defensive and attacking. And that's what Paul's saying. Knowledge puffs up, man. It can make you prideful. And knowledge isn't the enemy, but it can make God an enemy. This is the story of the scriptures, right? In the very beginning, when God set before Adam and Eve, here's this tree, you can't eat from this fruit. Basically, when the deceiver came along, he lied to them and he said to them that if you eat of this thing, then you will be like God. You'll have a knowledge that makes you like him. That's why God doesn't want you to eat it. And ultimately, when we get information, we can get to the point where we know so much that we think we don't need God. We become full of pride and arrogance and God doesn't have this thing figured out and this is why bad things are happening and this is, we try to answer things on our own and we move God out of the picture and say, I'm my own God. And when knowledge becomes the goal as opposed to just a growth process to reach the goal, God can become someone who we think we don't even need anymore. And that is dangerous. That is scary. I have a friend who was in my wedding, his name is Ben Thomas, and the story of Ben is, it's a beautiful story, and it's also a, a scary story, and it, it ends up beautiful. But there was this, this, this path that Ben has gone on is unbelievable. I went to high school with Ben, and Ben, uh, when we were in high school, he was a avid, pot-smoking, Jimi Hendrix guitar-playing freak. I mean, this guy, his hair was down to the, you know, the middle of his back, and he was failing out of every single class except for Japanese. He had an A in Japanese, and I was in Japanese with him. Watashiwa namai wa kyokendes. That means, hello, my name is Mad Dog. It's all I remember. But Ben was a language genius. And so he went to class, Japanese class, when he was failing everything else, and he'd walk in and say, Sensei, just give me the test. And he'd get it, hand it to her, straight A, and then walk out and leave. Ultimately, he was going to drop out because he wasn't passing enough classes, but for some reason he was intrigued by language. Well, one summer after we got home from this really crazy fun Bible camp, this church camp, where, where we would constantly renew our faith, Ben Thomas called up my brother and my brothers who um, were pot smokers. I mean, they, they, were, they were heavily involved in drugs. And so my, my brother answered the phone and, and Ben said, hey man, you want to get together and smoke pot? And my brother said to him, no, I don't want to do that anymore, but if you want to come over and hear about Jesus, then I'll tell you about Jesus. So, like, my brother, who was a pot smoker, then tells him, I don't want to do that anymore. And he was like, what? You want, to, you want to talk about Jesus? So he came over, and he shared Christ with him, and Ben gave his life to the Lord. So what happened is, is Ben then went to Word of Life Bible Institute for one year, which is, which is a, a one-year, 12-month, it's, it, it's one-year college, but it's 12 months of studying the Bible. And he got so into the Scriptures, he was so excited about that. Then he transferred to Grace College and Theological Seminary. And he started to study and learn and grow. And he got so smart and so gifted at Hebrew and Greek, which are the two main languages that the scriptures are written in. 
He was so gifted at it that by the time he was a sophomore in college, he was teaching Greek 1, Greek 2, Hebrew 1, and Hebrew 2 to the seminary students. He was so smart. Then he got a, 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 a full ride to finish his master's at Grace College and Seminary while he was still teaching the whole time. Then he got a full fellowship to go to the Uni- University of Chicago and study Near Eastern Semitic languages. And he was so gifted and so smart in terms of language that ultimately his school sent him and a bunch of other people over um, to the Middle East to do a dig to find ancient artifacts. While they were over there, they found something in the ground, and nobody could read it but Ben. So Ben gets it in front of him. He said this is what this means because he was such a a gifted student of the language that, that, that this artifact had something written in on it, and he ended up in National Geographic. This is a guy who was in my wedding. This is a guy who didn't graduate from high school. So he went all the way through his PhD, and then he graduated, and I called him about a year ago, and I said, how are you doing? Where are you going to church? He said, I'm not going to church. Why aren't you going to church? And he said, Joel, I've I've really lost my faith in God. And I was like, what? Why? He said, Joel, it just all became words on a page. My faith became so much about information, so much about finding out the newest thing that I lost the relationship that I had with God. And my heart broke. I was like, oh, man, like, you missed it. Like, knowledge is great, but it's just part of the process to keep us more in love with God and more in love with people. God didn't give us information so that one day we could go, we don't need him. God didn't tell us, you know, stuff about himself and give us the ability to learn and grow so that we could grow out of a relationship with God. He gave it to us so that we could constantly turn and learn and look at things in a new light and ultimately do what he set forth for us to do, which is to love people. Now, Ben really struggled through this, but he fought through it. He's, and he has a, he's kind of resurfaced and said, you know, I still have my faith in Jesus. But the informational nature of his study has really challenged, really made him struggle with the scriptures and who Jesus was. And see, that's what can happen. Knowledge isn't the enemy, but if you're not careful to put knowledge in its place, it can cause you to get arrogant and puff up. And then he says, but love builds up. Love builds up. So knowledge has this ability to make you arrogant, but when you put knowledge in its proper place, now you can do what God says. Instead of bubbling, you can build. Instead of living for yourself and information, you can be transformed and build relationships with people and build up the people around you and install things and help people, clothe people, feed people, teach people the truth, show people the truth by the way you live your life. Build people up. Exist for someone else. Knowledge puffs you up. Love builds someone else up. It's not about knowing something. This is about helping someone. That's the goal. That's depth. So we go through this process of deciding to follow God, and then we grow. We learn things, and we should never stop learning things, but ultimately that should lead us to catching. Your goal when you learn something should be, what am I going to do with this to help other people? How are we going to better ourselves so that we can better the people around us? Paul does something else that's fascinating right after this this phrase that he just said about building up. He says this, he says, those who think they know something, Basically, this is people who are captivated, mesmerized by information. Those who think they know something. In this context, he's going, for all of you people that know about this vision of your freedom to eat whatever you want, you think you know something. You're caught up in some information. You're caught up in some, some inside track. You are caught up on a piece of information that is taking you away from what God wants you to do. He says this because you do not yet know what you ought to know. 
Basically, what he says is there's a hierarchy in what you know. You think you know something, this inside track about being able to eat food sacrificed to idols? Big deal you know that. You don't know the thing you ought to know. You don't know the thing that's more important. And for those of you that are in here today, you need to know that you don't need to know everything in order to follow God. You need to know the most important things. You need to put what God says is true. And you need to say, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to follow. This piece of information. And ultimately, in knowledge, there is priority. There are things that are fundamental. Fundamental to your faith. Ultimately, what we're teaching in this series, loving people, laying down your life for people, reaching out to the least of these, letting the word of God and the life of Jesus move you back to the goal. As you learn that, you have these fundamentals, but what can happen is you think you know something. You think that because you know something that you're special. What makes you special is not that thing that you know that everybody else doesn't know. What makes you special is when you take the concrete fundamentals of the faith and it moves you into action and in caring for people. I don't want to send like the wrong message, right? Paul wants us to learn. We are supposed to learn. In fact, knowledge is not the enemy. You're supposed to let your knowledge turn you into a friend. You're supposed to let your knowledge turn you into someone who helps. Paul says to the people in Corinth who are actually caught up in a dispute about who the best teacher is in Corinth. Peter was a teacher, this guy named Apollos was a teacher, and Paul was a teacher. And ultimately, they're fighting over who's the smartest and who's the best to lead. And he says, you guys, when you're fighting over information, you're missing the point. He says this to them, and you may have never caught this, but he opens up uh, the first section of the book of Corinthians like this. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, Peter, or the whole world, or life or death, or the present or the future, all are yours. So what I don't wanna, I don't wanna send the wrong message. Go and learn. We, we took our staff to the Global Leadership Summit with all these different people who are experts in all areas of industry, and they taught us things that we would never learn if we just studied the Bible. You are supposed to learn. You're supposed to grow. You're supposed to go after information. We're supposed to get really good at what we do and understand why we do it. But if we let why we do it become just learning, we miss it, man. We are missing what God has for us. We are not deep. We are shallow. We are making it about us. We are making it about information. We are not knowing the thing we ought to know. The thing we ought to know is that loving people is most important and putting that into action. And then he says, here's the thing you ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. And then at the end of the passage, he links, and throughout the whole New Testament, there's a link between loving God and loving people. We're going to talk a lot about that next week, but if you say that you love God, but you don't love people, you don't love God. So he makes this thing, here's what you ought to know. You ought to know that you're supposed to love people, and whoever loves God loves people. You see, guys, the goal of knowledge is not to know something but to build someone, to help someone. Uh, when I was getting my, my master's, I was doing it online through Liberty University, and I had to do a class about confrontation, and I wrote a story of confrontation at the job I was working at at the time between myself and my boss. You could imagine that I had some conflict. There was a moment where I got in a fight in front of other people. It wasn't one of my best days. But I got in this conflict with my boss. And so I wrote about it. And uh, I, at the same time, learned and met a man named Rich Halcom, who runs the Stowe Center. And so the Stowe Center is a place that exists to help people. It exists to feed people. It exists to put clothes uh, on people's back. It exists to reach an area of this city that is underserved and in basic poverty, and it, it, it's down there. They feed 90,000 people a year. It's unbelievable, and Rich is the director of that, and I had met him because he had come to the church that I worked at, and so I got to know this guy. Well, one day, 
when he was up at the church, after I had written this paper, knowing who he was, he approached me and he said, hey, Joel, how's that conflict going that you wrote about in your paper? And I was like, what conflict? And he was like, you know, your conflict paper, how's that, how's that conflict between you and that person going? And I said, what are you talking about? Like, how do you, and he's like, no, I, you know the thing you said in, in, your, in your, your program, in your master's pro-. And I said, how do you know about that? And he said, Joel, I'm Dr. Rich Halcom. I'm your professor. And I was like, oh, my word. I didn't know because I just had a professor that I had never met before, and his name was Dr. Rich Halcom. And I, I just saw Dr. Halcom. I thought there's lots of Dr. Halcoms. I never once thought that it was the same guy and that he was teaching satellite from Columbus, Ohio. And it was in that moment that I learned, man, I can be really dumb sometimes. And also that it, something struck me. Rich has his PhD. Rich is a doctor, Dr. Rich Halcom. And he took all of that information and he leveraged it to help people. He doesn't want to be called doctor. Because he didn't become a doctor so he could know something. He learned the scriptures and he learned leadership principles and he learned how to lead an organization so that it could result in the kind of love that God says it should result in. Reaching and helping people. Rich spends his life fishing for people. Rich spends all that knowledge and leverages it to help people see who can't see, to help people with horrible problems with their teeth, and he gives them amazing blessings by cleaning their teeth and filling their teeth and bringing in dentists for free, all of that to help people. This has happened for me, of course, as well. I remember years ago, Pastor Warren, who was a mentor of mine and a beloved friend of mine, he passed away last year of cancer, and some of you were pastored by him, and he was a genius. He knew the scriptures more than than anyone I know. And One day he told me something, he taught me something. He said, Joel, in Genesis, when it says, if you eat of the tree, eat of the fruit of the knowledge of, of good and evil, it says, in that day you will die. And he told me that in the Hebrew, that that means in dying you will die. He said that that word has two meanings. It means that you will be separated from God right away in, in this relationship capacity, in this spiritual sense, you'll be separated from God. And then ultimately in the process of being separated from God, your body will die. And so you will die, be separated from God, and in the process of dying physically, you will ultimately die spiritually. Two different types of death, the physical death and the spiritual death. And when I learned that, I was like, oh, that's really cool, that's really interesting. And it helped me teach the gospel more, and it helped me kind of tell people, like, you don't want to have to get to the second death. You see, we're all going to die one time. And the scriptures say it's appointed on a man once to die and then the judgment. And I, I kind of put all these things together and you're going to die physically, but you don't have to die spiritually if you give your life to Jesus. And it was great that I knew that. And, and it helped me with some knowledge. And then I started pastoring. And then I started sitting down with people who had lost a loved one. And they looked at me. And they said, what does this death mean? What does it mean, Joel? What does it mean when someone dies physically? I need help. I need hope. I need to understand. And I got to tell them that God doesn't want anyone to die twice, just physically one time. But if you give your life to Jesus, then you never have to die spiritually. And everything that Warren told me was a great piece of information that at times had puffed me up and made me feel smarter than other people. But when I did what God wanted me to do with it, it actually extended across the table and it wrapped the arms of hope and love around someone who had just lost a loved one. Because God didn't tell me that so that I could know something. God told me that so that I could love someone. And that is why you should learn. And that is why we should follow Jesus. And that is why we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that is why we should learn and grow and push 
And that is why we should get into small group discussions. And that is why we should have one-on-one discussions. And that is why we should open up the scriptures and see what Jesus did and listen to what he said and learn it and try to put it into practice so that we can reach the goal that he set out before us to reach and to help people. And that, my friends, that is deep. Deeper than anything you'll ever know will be the moment that you love someone right where they are. And you do what Jesus said from the very beginning, to fish for people. Let's take a minute and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for not just telling us that we need to know something and then do it, but to show us. You did this. You lived this out. You know everything, and you emptied yourself to serve us. You helped us. You reached us because you loved us. Father, help us to do the same. Help us to think the same. Help us to live the same. We love you so much. We thank you for letting us be a part of your family and be a part of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen.